born in St. Catharines, Ontario, and I've lived in St. Catharines, Ontario for most of my life, except for a period of time when I went to school. I went to school at McMaster University and then moved to Toronto to start working, and then 1986 moved back to the region. My parents were from Abruzzo, Italy. They immigrated in the early 50s here to Canada, and a land of opportunity. My dad actually had, had been in Belgium. He was working in Belgium. I had gone from Italy to Belgium as a, as a very young man. I was looking for opportunities and had heard of Canada and knew some other people that were here in Canada and decided to immigrate here. They both came to St. Catharines. They both immigrated here separately. They did not know each other when they immigrated here and then met here in Canada and, and, and were married. My mother came here to follow some other family members as well. And later I was born and my sister was born. My parents taught me two important things in life. And the first is a work ethic. Work hard in life and things will, will come to you. And the second was, and they really pushed this one, is the value of an education. Uh, they did not have the opportunity to have an education, or the in-depth education. And so it's always about obtain an education, you'll figure out what to do, but make sure you obtain a good education in life. Went to school at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. Did my undergrad there and then also did my graduate studies there. I, I graduated with an MBA. In terms of academics, I have a Bachelor of Commerce degree from McMaster. I also have an MBA in, uh, specializing in finance from, from McMaster University. I'm also a certified management accountant as well. And uh, really, the, um, one, one of the interesting things I did in my lifetime or in, in my career was I did my undergrad studies and went to the workforce, then went back and did my MBA a number of years later and really gained an appreciation for what I was being taught at school, a theory as I call it, and being applied in the business world. Just meant so much more to me being able to do that. The last four years I've been chair of the Niagara Health System Foundation. I'm, I'm currently the past chair, where we're raising the funds required for the new health care facility in St. Catharines, which includes a cancer treatment center as well. So I've done that. I've been on the board of Niagara College. I've also been on the uh, St. Catharines Hospital Foundation board as well. Well, I, I always believe in giving back to the community, and so does uh, and the people I work with. So it's great that we're able to donate our time and resources to, to help the community at large. I believe that, especially with, for example, with health care, being able to provide better health care in the, in, the, in the region really helps our employees and helps attract other individuals to this community. In terms of accomplishments, I really hate to answer that question. I like trying to turn the question around and say, what, what provides me the greatest satisfaction? in life and to me it's pretty simple. Uh, what I look at is, for example, in terms of driving satisfaction is my children and have they developed into fine outstanding citizens or, or individuals and I believe they have. Christopher and Eric who are, are great individuals, proud to be and proud to be their father, that I know that in their lifetime they will, will uh, contribute to society in many ways. And with that, I did not raise them alone. It's my wife, Susan, who had a lot to do with it, who spent many hours when I may not have been there. But to me, it's a family element and making sure the family it, it succeeds in life. One question I get asked a lot uh, is, um, sometimes employees will come up to me and say, I have younger children going to university or in the university and are gonna graduate. What words of advice do you have for them? They may not know what, they're, what they wanna do in their career. How can you help them? My answer is very simple. Don't worry about if they don't know what they want to do in life. Just make sure they're getting a good education and they will try different things. So for example, I thought I wanted to be an engineer all my life. Went into first year university, hated engineering. Then went into business. And in business I thought I wanted to be an accountant the rest of my life. And as I, as I uh, went on the journey, I, I learned maybe accounting wasn't for me. Maybe it was something else in business. And I went into marketing and later went into, into uh, the systems area. So I've had many experiences, and so what I, what I try to give the advice to the, the individuals in university now is don't worry about having that specific career goal. You'll figure it out once you get into the workforce, and you'll see what you gravitate towards and what you're really good at, and it's a journey. I mean, it's a privilege and an honor to be here this evening and to be recognized by, by the, this great organization. So thank you very much. I'm very humbled, and uh, keep up the good work that you're doing.
Hi, my name is Ted Vanderzong. And I'm Miriam Vanderzong. I was born in Italy, in a small town in Frosinone province, southern Lazio. It's about an hour and a half from Rome. And I wasn't as fortunate, but I was born in the beautiful Niagara region and the Garden City of St. Catharines. We met in 1987. As a young man, I was invited uh, by um, Italian missionaries to come and help them in the uh, country of Tanzania in East Africa. And uh, they had in need of a young man to uh, help them start a water project, drilling wells and building windmills. So right out of university, I went as a single man to Tanzania. And uh, after working three years there um, on my own as a single person, I had the um, great fortune of meeting my wife Miriam there. Well, it was not my intention to immigrate to Canada, but after meeting Ted, we decided to get married, and I came to Canada. We got married in 89, and then uh, when we got back from Tanzania in 93, I became a landed immigrant. We went back to Tanzania um, as a newlywed couple, and we stayed there for three years, and our first child, Sarah, was born in Tanzania. And when Sarah was one years old, we had to seriously consider the responsibility that comes with a child on the scene now. Um, we worked for free all our lives, and now with Sarah uh, in the picture, we had to seriously consider our finances, so we both decided it was best we move back to Niagara and seek uh, employment. I have to say that uh, one of the many blessings that I've had uh, in, in my life would be uh, having parents who were very persistent and consistent in, in instilling in us um, values of caring for our fellow man. Um, to count our blessings, the fact that living here in the Negra region we were truly blessed and that we had many blessings, but that these blessings were not meant for us alone, but rather that we had to learn to first share with our own brothers. And then um, dad and mom, through their example of sharing with people in need, also taught us to reach further than our own home, but to reach out to those less fortunate than ourselves. The reason I, I became a missionary worker, I have to say, I don't believe it was my own choice. I believe it's something that God had planned for me since the very beginning, but he was working with a stubborn Dutchman. It took me a long time to come to the realization that um, this is what God was calling me to. Um, when I was, I have to say, it was always in my heart. When I was a young boy and watched television shows and early Sunday morning saw the poor starving children on TV, um, I really cringed and it really touched me deeply. Um, I would sometimes as a young boy just find myself crying when I saw these poor children on TV. And I was determined to do something about it, not knowing how or when. And I went through university again, not knowing what I was going to do with myself. And it was in my last year of university that some Italian missionaries did approach me and asked me, Ted, do you want to come to Tanzania? And uh, at first I, I kind of rejected the whole idea because yes, I was afraid. And um, with their encouragement and their telling me, Ted, trust in God, trust in God. He will help you through, he'll show you the way. And so I stepped out of my comfort zone of the Niagara region and the tight family circle that we had. And um, I did make my first journey to Tanzania. When I was growing up, I um, didn't watch much TV because we didn't have one in the house, but I read um, a magazine from missionaries and um, um, I was impressed by their work and uh, I felt I, I could do something to uh, to help the, the poor in the third world. So I became a, a nun um, and um, I went with a group of nuns to Tanzania um, working in a, um, in a mission that had uh, young girls from the, various tribes that wanted to, to join the congregation and I was uh, in charge of a group of them and I uh, taught them Italian and English and um, also worked in the clinics in the villages and I helped um, weighing babies, giving food out. You know there were many points in my life that I believe God was uh, calling this stubborn Dutchman and I kept refusing to hear the call and at, at one time there was a, a group of um, people from Guatemala who were financed by an organization to come to the Niagara region to canvass for help. Uh, while circulating the Niagara region, they had heard of the work that Miriam and I had done in Tanzania, and they made an appointment to come see us. Uh, we sat down and had a meeting, and after our meeting, they basically said, uh, Ted and Miriam, can you do for us in Guatemala what you did for the people in Tanzania? And. Uh, we, we couldn't believe they were asking this of us because we had four children at that time and they were just young little, you know, just babies. And 
It was like, uh, don't you know what you're asking us? I mean, we got four kids now. We have to take care of our family. And so they had left and Miriam and I were, you know, just weighing and, and basically trying to reason, you know, is it a reasonable request that what they're asking of us? How can we do this? We have kids now. And to make a long story short, we ran out of excuses why we could not do it. So um, we packed up our children, uh, pickup truck and filled a trailer with a half a year supply of what, everything we needed. And we drove to Guatemala. We lived in tents for six months and every two weeks we moved to a different village. And with this uh, grassroots frontline experience of poverty, um, we really saw the need for the people to have fresh, clean, reliable water sources. And uh, with this experience, Miriam and I came home and, and we made a commitment. We said, man, we gotta go back there. We cannot, we cannot not act on the knowledge we now have. Um, we gotta go, help them back those, uh, help, go back and help those people. And uh, the Wells of Hope project was born. You know, it's so hard to, to answer the question, what's my greatest accomplishment or what's our greatest accomplishments? Because uh, Miriam and I would both agree that without God, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. Surviving this all this time that we spent back and forth from here to Guatemala and keeping the kids in line with school and keeping them healthy and uh, helping also the people that came down to, to stretch out and reach the poor and providing them for, with a safe environment. I would have to build on what Miriam already articulated as the, the honor we have had to be a part of relationship building, of bringing the Niagara community to uh, front lines, meeting the poor, and um, that the poor actually stop being just the poor for many members of the Niagara community, that actual relationships were built, and that we were able to make these bridges, and uh, this allowed hope for our needing brothers and sisters in Guatemala. Um, because they will not be easily forgotten uh, due to the relationships that we are able to build. I recommend to anyone um, contemplating the idea of become a missionary, uh, I strongly encourage them, um, make God your foundation because with God the seemingly impossible does become possible. And stay faithful to that commitment to God and He'll stay faithful to you. And be um, uh, persistent and, and committed. Uh, times uh, it <laughs> good things don't come easy and uh, our work in Guatemala has proven that as well as our work in Tanzania um, good things don't come easy and any businessman would be able to tell you the same thing and to help the poor definitely is not an easy job or it would have been done a long time ago you um, you start to see your children in their children and it, it's so hard to turn your back on that once you start it like it stays in your blood and you you feel you need to, to keep going because uh, the people have a face and the poor out there have a face and you can't forget them. On behalf of Miriam and myself, uh, we would like to thank you so much for this tremendous, tremendous honor. We do not believe that we deserve it. Um, there's so many great people out there, so many unsung heroes, so many people that give their lives for their fellow man. Here in the Niagara region as well, there's so many people who, who reach out and help those less fortunate and are never recognized. And, and to them and to all the poor whom we serve who struggle every day just to make ends meet, I feel the contribution that Miriam and I have made is just a, a drop in the bucket compared to what families do for each other in the third world. So I do thank you for this tremendous, tremendous honor. And um, we hope that we can live up and measure up to the to the great honor that you bestow on us today.
I was born in St. Catharines, Ontario at the St. Catharines General Hospital and I was uh, raised in, in Winkley. I'm one of three children. I have two brothers, Michael and Jeremy, and myself, and I'm the middle child. My father is Frank Memmi, my mom is Beverly Memmi, and uh, they're the most amazing parents I could have ever wished for. The values that my parents instilled in me had everything to do with where I am today. My father is extremely different than my mom, and it's it in a, in a really wonderful way. My father actually taught me about business, about working hard, um, about tenacity, never giving up no matter what anyone says, you just keep on fighting. And my mother was more the spiritual side about it, about believing in yourself, being able to achieve your goals and your dreams and, and um, getting the negative people out of your life and focusing on the positive. So together, um, I was, I've been extremely blessed. I still am. They're still a huge part of my life. I consider them my, my best friends and I spend as much time as I can with them. And um, I don't think I'd be where I am today without, without the exact two parents that I, that I have. Um, the day I won Miss World Canada was completely unexpected. Um, I had no idea that I was even the pageant girl type. And um, I don't think that I was, the, the one thing that, that was interesting about winning Miss World Canada is that I don't even know if I knew that I had the right chops to win it. I mean, I wasn't the best at answering questions. I wasn't the prettiest one. I wasn't in the best shape. But um, you can achieve many things in life with believing in yourself in many, in many ways and just trying your best because you never know what's going to stand out. And I mean, winning Miss Canada actually made me feel that I can do many things in life and I can achieve many things in life. When you're a girl that was born and raised on a sod farm in Waynefleet with so few people that live in that small town and now I'm working in Hollywood, um, winning Miss Canada was definitely a pivotal point in my confidence and in my, in my life to, to believe that I can achieve many things. It was very cool. I think the thing I love most about hosting Sell This House is that anything can happen at any time to any one of us and it does. I wish so bad I could show you a blooper reel because you, it's, it's hilarious what happens on the show. Um, and it's, it's fun and I think that I really get to be myself on the show. Like everything you see on the show is exactly real. It's my personality, it's Roger's personality. So when Roger doesn't do any work, he really doesn't do any work. And when I do all the work, I really do all the work. See, and... <laughs> But anyways, and the arguments and the fight and the laughter, it, that's all real on the show. And that's, that's, I love that about hosting Sell This House. And especially, you know, helping people sell their houses, the kinds of situations that come up are pretty crazy. It's a pretty stressful time in the homeowners' lives. And, and we're, we're, we're a part of that. Oh, God. What do Roger and I disagree about? Well, okay, there's sometimes, I think there's some pretty odd choices that Roger makes sometimes that we disagree on. Um... I think that I'm the kind of person where I, I like to get involved with the homeowners' lives. Like during those three days, we are in the trenches with these people. And I kind of like to ease them through. There's no easing with Roger. No. He kind of is what he is. He's the designer, does what he, you know, does, does what he has to do. And he's a very intimidating guy to the homeowners. So they're always coming up to me, you know, off camera going, does Roger like me? I mean, I don't know if he likes me. Seriously, he's just, he looks so big and so I'm so intimidated. I'm like, oh, he's just a big teddy bear. You go tell him if you hate everything he's doing, you go tell him. And so they'll go tell him and then he just shuts them down so fast. They end up coming up to me saying, why'd you tell me to do that? So we kind of disagree a little bit on how we are with the homeowners, I guess. But it works, you know? Roger's definitely the kind of person he is. I'm the kind of person I am and together, it works. We're a great team together. And he eats way too many chocolate chip cookies. The most challenging house that we've ever had to work on actually didn't have anything to do with the house. It had to do with the lifestyle of the couple that we chose for that episode. It was in the Midwest somewhere. It was, I think, season five. And this couple, they were the most adorable couple. You know, they kind of had a few teeth missing. They were all tattooed up. They were, there was a biker couple. They were, you know, they had like these Metallica shirts on and these worn out jeans. And they, they had their whole thing going and the two of them were so in love with each other. We had to have them on the show. But the thing about their lifestyle is they had, okay, get this, one pot belly pig, a ferret, a uh, seven feral cats, five dogs, or seven dogs, can't remember how many. Um, 
Did I say peacock? There's, there's also, I think they had, okay, peacock as well. They had all these animals, it was crazy. And then they had kind of like the, they would, you could open up the back screen door and it would go onto, you know, into their lawn. And so the animals could kind of come and go as they want. Now they didn't have any furniture. So we walked in their house and we're like, why didn't you have any furniture? And they said, well, we don't have furniture because the dogs eat it all the time. Not only were, was there a pot belly pig walking around and chickens and everything else walking in the house as we're trying to do this, this show, the the um, the guy who owned the house, he was so sweet, but he had a flatulence device. And so whenever somebody would come to the door, instead of a regular doorbell, he would you know press the remote control button and a different type of ethnicity of flatulence, who knew which one was going to come up next, would you know would greet the anybody who ever came to the door. The, the, the reason why it was so difficult to get this show done and this episode done is because every time Roger and I were in the middle of a scene with him, he'd have this remote control in his back pocket and let one rip. <laughs> and we couldn't get anything done. Roger was actually, at, by the end, trying to guess which ethnicity of flatulence it was. I wonder why he has so much knowledge on that topic. <laughs> About two years ago, World Vision Canada came to me to ask them to be their spokesperson and go to Cambodia and research topics. Um, well, the two major topics that I reported on was child labor and child trafficking. And I didn't know a lot about it at the time. And then I started doing some research and about a year ago I was in, I went to Cambodia. And um, what I saw there and what I experienced and what I learned, you know, words can't describe. And so I was absolutely honored and thrilled to be able to be a part of this and learn something um, and, and realize the, the true devastation of this problem that does go on every day. And whenever I do take on a project like that, I, I really try to get into it more than I think just a regular host. And I said to them, I go, you know what, I really want to go and see what kind of people are wrapped up in the child trafficking world. So I literally put on a baseball cap, jeans and a t-shirt, and we went into one of these karaoke bars, and um, which they're all over, you know, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And I actually went in and I saw, you know, who's involved with this and who's purchasing these girls. and. And um, it was it was really sad, and it's a, it's an overwhelming problem. And um, but you know, being a part of World Vision, I I also saw the other end of it, where I saw these um, rescue centers that World Vision had opened up, and I interviewed the girls that had gotten caught up in the child trafficking world, and I interviewed I interviewed girls from the age of nine to fourteen, and um, they were the toughest interviews and the most challenging interviews I've ever had to do. Um, and I'm doing my best to help create awareness. I won an award called the Crystal Reel Award, which uh, it was actually for Best Actress in an independent film. And I was very excited about it. It was uh, my first big lead role in a horror movie. And I was playing opposite Corey Feldman, actually. I had a blast with it. I had no idea that I was, that I was gonna win an award for it, but it was actually a tough role. It was a role where I had to go from the girl next door to this like psychopath, virus-ridden, girl who just be, just is crazy and um, starts kind of ripping out her nails and everything is <laughs> it sounds gross but I have to tell you it was so much fun it was like Halloween on steroids and uh, I just I just got right into the role and and I hope to do more horror movies in the future I know next year I'm, I'm slated to do two more films they're not horror movies one is a romantic comedy and one is, is a drama and the romantic comedy, I'm going to be playing the lead role. And then the drama, I have a, a smaller but very substantial role in that. So I'm excited about those two movies as well. I have a CD called Gemini that I just released. Uh, I think it was last year. You can buy it on iTunes, on my website. And it was so much fun. Um, I, I'm a singer as well, which a lot of people don't know that. And I love the process of singing. And I love the whole recording process, which is fantastic. I think I did it at a time when I had too much on my plate. Recording a CD is almost like therapy. Every song means something to you. And in order to make the song come to life and to really give that emotional value to a song, you have to, you have to connect with something that happened in your life. So every single song, um, I, I definitely relate it to something that has happened in my life. I'd say that out of anything I've ever done in my entire career, my greatest accomplishment is going to Cambodia and reporting on child trafficking and child labor. It's, it's my way of giving back. It's extremely enlightening. It's, um, it's tough, but it's incredible. And it's given me so much um, 
fulfillment. More than anything I've ever done, it's given me so much fulfillment. And the other thing too, knowing that I don't get paid for it, it's completely voluntary. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I do genuinely from my heart. There's, there's nothing to gain by, for me, other than just giving back and, and making a difference in somebody's life. When I'm not working and I'm at home and I'm in Los Angeles for, you know, at least a month at a time, which doesn't happen that often, but um, when I do have time off, one of my greatest passions now is something new to me, actually, that I started doing, and that is rescuing animals from kill shelters in Los Angeles. Um, basically what I do is I just go to the shelter and I choose one or two dogs. I do it with my girlfriend Lisa. There was this one poodle called, uh, her name is Cindy. I fell in love with this poodle. She was nine years old and had teeth problems, cataract. They were going to put her down the next day. I mean, the, the shelter couldn't even believe that I chose this dog. They're like, out of all these dogs, there's puppies, this, that. Why are you choosing this old dog? <laughs> and I'm definitely someone who, I, I love the underdog stories. I love, I always gravitate to the, the, you know, the people and the animals that have the worst circumstances and I try and help them. And so that's kind of what I did for this dog and I named her Cindy for Cinderella because she went from rags to riches. And uh, we had her on Good Day LA. I put two little purple bows in her hair and fluffed up, you know, washed her and cleaned her and got, I had her teeth cleaned, I had her groomed. And then I had 50 phone calls after the show of people wanting this dog. And it just amazes me how there, there, there is room to, to make you know, to make a difference in these, these animals' lives and to save them. And there's a lot of people out there that want pets. I just want to say thank you so much to all the Chiba members that nominated me and chose me to, to win this award and accept this award. I'm just so excited and, and honored and, and I'm glad to be a part of it. And um, I'm very, very happy that I was available to come here and actually receive it in person. It means the world to me. And, um, and just thank you, thank, thank you for thinking about me and, and your kindness, it, it, it goes a long way. My name is Frankie Perello, and I'm born in Italy, 1944, 24 November, in Mangone, Italy, province of Cosenza. Province of Cosenza. My family was six boys and one girl. I'm, a, I'm a the youngest one of the family. I came in Canada in 1962. I came by myself and uh, bought. A year later, my mother and my father come over because my my brother was here already. My oldest brother was here already. Come over here to better better life a little bit, and then my uncle was here already. So and uh, they told him to come over. So we did. When I six, 62, whatever. And there was a, not much a struggle for me because some other people were here already. Like my brother was here and everything. And. Uh, I find a job or whatever and go to school, nice school, to learn the language first. And uh, as a, and the junior day was a working. And I, I want to take an apprenticeship to automotive mechanic. And I went to, that's what I did. And then I went to work in the factory when he was young. And, uh, and I said, it was for me. I don't like, I don't like working in a factory. It was good, but it's not for me. So, and I went back to make sure I got the training and everything to learn the automotive mechanic. A few years later, I met a Rita, who is my wife. And in 1969, we got married. And, uh, and then we had two children, a boy and a girl, twins. So, and uh, I still work for some uh, auto, some firm automotive mechanic up to 1974, 75. And then I decided to go on my own. So I try my own and uh, still working. And uh, we had so many people work from us. And then we, later years, maybe 
we opened a fruit and veggie store in St. Catherine, and my wife was running. And then for there we sold, because it was too much work for, for me and for my wife, for Rita. And then I keep up the business, original auto parts business, auto recycle. I was at Club Roma, if you guys are with the Italian club, I'm gonna become a member there. And I like soccer. And uh, I come a member of the Club Roma, you know, and uh, I go on the help them, working over there, and I go on a board. After I was on a board, and they wanted me to meet the friends and other people, so I come on a, the, go on a board director. So I run for the board director. After I was then a board director, I went to to be on a, uh, I was on the board, and then I became a vice president, and I stayed for six years vice president of the club. Been doing the time, I was an, uh, I was, a, it was a soccer, because I was like soccer, and I needed a president of soccer. And I was a vice president of the club, and president of soccer. So, it, it we done it very well. In 1994, we come, uh, the, the team become a national. And uh, we come, we wanted the national Canada, whole Canada for, for Roma, Roma soccer, Roma club. And then I was involved with the Calabrese club because I'm a Calabrese. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, I still come a member over there. They're supposed to build the club, but still not, not there yet. And uh, we, you know, still come a member. And then I, I come a member of Club Italia. And uh, I still remember Club Italia, you know, just social club, like you want to go with the friends and everything to go there. Last, last year, the first year, and this, you know, the, my second year now to the Memorial Golf Tournament for my wife. And uh, the first year, last year we raised uh, roughly $46,000. We donated it to the Wallspring in Niagara. And uh, this year we did, and uh, the economy is a little bit worse than we were before, but we still raised about around $22,000. And uh, we donated $11,000, we donated to uh, Children's Center St. Catherine. And at 11000 we donated to Wall Spring Niagara. The, the Children's Center in either, Kansas City in either, same thing, so we try to help them both in the community here in St. Catherine, and Niagara, and regional Niagara, actually, you know, the state and regional, you know, in know other town. We try to support, we try to do the better, and then we try to support all you know, the, the, because they, we will have any either some, you know, the money and everything else. Right now we do the children's center in the, in the Kansas side, but if we need anything else, we need a little bit, maybe we can, we can share, whatever we can do. We try to help the regional. I'll enjoy, enjoy work, enjoy my life, what I do. Unfortunately, you know, it could be better, but you know, with the uh, fire my wife run, but we do our best. Well, the greatest accomplishment in the business I, got, I am, you know, I come in, I, I come into the whole country, and I want to, and I want this country great. You've got a lot of opportunity in this country. And we got thanks this country to to have us to be here and everything because we can you know, and enjoy and, and and that's the opportunity you know we had the opportunity and we tried to 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 do it to work. And all the members have done a wonderful job. It's growing and uh, they do a wonderful job for the community and everything. I'm gonna thank uh, the, the the president and the board director Chiba and all the member, the community of the, the Chiba to honor me. I don't think that uh, I look forward to do that because uh, I don't need anything, but I still got thanks because they, they did that. And they think about me, whatever, and uh, I got thanks to them, all of them.